She's like a sickness in my brain A vision standing by the window pane She ripples through the blinds And leaves me in a daze It's in the way her body moves me The way she grabs me and intoxicates Until the signal's in my mind Forget to operate Hello, everybody, and welcome back to my channel. Thank you for joining me for another Coffee and Crime Time. Today, we're talking about the case of a missing child that has gone unsolved for far too long. But recently, some new developments have occurred, which may see the case being closed once and for all. And the family of nine-year-old Michaela Joy Garrett may finally have some closure. During this video, as a heads up, we're going to talk not only about Michaela's case, but about a lot of other cases that are on the periphery of her case. And I really wanted to go more in depth on all of them. Um, there was things that I had never heard of before. It was a struggle, honestly, to not follow that path and go more in depth. But I know that this video is going to be long as it is. So I wasn't really able to just go as deep as I wanted to. But if there are any cases that spark your interest that you do want to see me make a dedicated video on, let me know in the comments. I'll be in there reading the comments, taking notes, um, making sure you feel heard and that, you know, we get everything you want on the channel. But before we dive into the case, let's have a word from the sponsor of today's video, Surfshark VPN. I personally value my privacy and my freedom online. I value my privacy and my freedom in life as well. And Surfshark VPN helps me achieve both of these things. Surfshark is a modern VPN designed with the user in mind, which for me as the user means it's easy to use because if it was even slightly complicated, I, I wouldn't make it. I'm very technologically challenged. Uh, you guys know this. When you're using Surfshark, it encrypts all the data sent via the internet, protecting all the stuff you want to keep from prying eyes like your passwords, your personal photos, banking details, and other sensitive information. I also love that Surfshark follows a strict no logs policy, which means that they not only protect you from others on the internet using your personal information, but they themselves never monitor, track, or store what you do online. And did you know that your internet provider does that? Surfshark has no idea what you're doing online and they don't want to know because it's not their business. They keep no connection or activity logs. They're very hands off. They also use industry leading encryption. They hide your IP address and they take their security to the next level with private DNS and leak protection. And I know I just said a lot of words. Maybe some of them didn't make sense because I know they didn't to me until I looked into them. But all I really care about is knowing that while I'm using Surfshark on the internet, I'm protected from hackers, from companies that want to use my personal information specifically to target ads to me, all sneaky and spy-like. From the college student at the table next to me at Starbucks who's quietly stealing my banking information while I jam out to Hamilton and sip my peppermint mocha latte. And if that's not important to you, maybe you'll appreciate how much Surfshark opens the internet up to everyone who uses it. They use no border mode, which allows you to successfully use Surfshark in restrictive regions, which makes it an excellent choice for streaming and bypassing geographical restrictions on streaming platforms such as Netflix, Disney+, Plus, YouTube, and more. So if you've ever clicked on a video and it says like not available in your area, in fact, I think I have a video like this, uh, Tara Calico Part 2, where a lot of people say they can't watch it, it's not available in their area. Well, Surfshark will help with that. If you've ever been desperately waiting for the new season of Peaky Blinders, but it hasn't released in the States yet, Surfshark will help with that. If you keep trying to watch a March Madness game on Watch ESPN and they keep telling you that it's blacked out in your region and you just want to see Syracuse play, 
Surfshark will help with that. And for a limited time, you can get 84% off a two-year plan and four extra months for free at surfshark.deals slash Stephanie Harlow. This special offer makes your subscription just $2.13 a month. And I know I didn't mention it yet, but the thing that really sets Surfshark apart from other VPN services for me is the fact that you can use it on unlimited devices. Your phone, your tablet, your computer, your kid's tablet, your husband's phone, your mom's computer. Unlimited truly means unlimited. So go to surfshark.deals slash Stephanie Harlow to get 84% off a two-year plan plus four months free and start browsing securely on all your devices today. Unlimited devices. Let's jump into the case. So Michaela Garrett's abduction was one of those cases that really shook California, and it reached nationwide proportions. If you're into true crime, if you follow true crime cases, especially cold cases, uh, everyone pretty much knows about Michaela's case. And it was just so stunning because it happened. She was there one minute, and then she was gone. And it, it felt like just such a split second that your whole world can change as her parents, as her friends, as her community. Everybody was sitting there wondering how this little girl could vanish and there could be literally you know, nothing left behind, no leads to follow. Michaela was called Kayla by her friends. She was a bright and happy nine-year-old girl in 1988. On November 19th, the first day of Thanksgiving vacation, Michaela woke up and dressed in a pair of blue jeans, black shoes, a white t-shirt that had the word Metro printed on it, and white plastic earrings shaped like feathers. She had breakfast with her family and then asked her mother, Sharon, if she could ride her scooter to the nearby Rainbow Market with her best friend and neighbor, Trina Rodriguez. Now, Sharon was described as being a really good mother, a careful mother, almost overprotective at points. The family had just moved to this neighborhood in Hayward, California, two years prior. And for a long time, Sharon wouldn't even let her children play outside the yard of their own home until she was sure that the surrounding neighborhood was safe. Now, Michaela had been to the Rainbow Market before. It was just two blocks away from her house, but she'd always been there with her parents or with her neighbors who were teenagers. She was always with somebody who was older. She'd never been there by herself. Now, Sharon told Michaela no at first, but her daughter begged and promised to be careful. So Sharon eventually gave in, and she said yes. She stood at the door and watched the two young girls climb onto their scooters. Michaela turned around and told her mother, I love you, Mom, before they scooted down the driveway. Sharon watched until they had reached the end of the block and vanished from sight before going back inside to finish the breakfast dishes. Once at the market, Michaela and Trina left their scooters outside the front door and went inside. They bought two Mountain Dews, two sticks of beef jerky, and two cherry-flavored taffies. And then they left the store, and they began to walk home, forgetting that they had ridden their scooters to the market. They hadn't even really gotten out of the parking lot before they remembered, and they rushed back to collect the scooters but one was missing. Michaela and Trina glanced around trying to figure out where the other scooter had gone off to when Michaela spotted the missing scooter about three parking spots away from the front of the market sitting next to a parked car. Trina waited while Michaela went to retrieve it, but as she bent down to grab the scooter by its handlebars, something terrifying happened. A man jumped out of the parked car next to the scooter and grabbed Michaela. And while she screamed and fought and tried to get away, he forced her into his vehicle. Trina could only watch, frozen in shock, as the car her friend had just been forced into tore out of the parking lot and onto Mission Boulevard. And just like that, within a minute or two, Michaela was gone. Trina ran inside the market and asked the cashier on duty, a woman named Rona Ronalyn, to call the police. Trina then called her father, who told her he would be right there. Back at the Garrett house, not much time had passed, certainly not enough for Sharon to be worried about the girls. She was inside the house when she heard shouting coming from outside, and her husband Rod came running in and told her that Michaela had been taken and he was going to the market. Rod had been outside working on his car in the driveway when Trina's father drove by on his way to the Rainbow Markets and let Rod know what had happened. The police response was actually very quick. By the time both the men arrived at the market, the police had already gotten there and they were interviewing the cashier, Rona. 
even though Trina was the only eyewitness, the only one to have actually seen the perpetrator and his vehicle, she was not questioned by police at that time. She was allowed to go home with her father. And this, in my opinion, was a very big mistake. Rona, the cashier, had never even seen the man. Trina was the only one who actually had witnessed it happen. But she would not be questioned until two days after the abduction. So that crucial first 48 hours was lost. Rona said she'd seen a man she thought might have been the kidnapper outside of the store earlier when the girls were inside. She said she thought maybe he was planning to rob her and he walked by the store window very slowly looking inside. Rona felt that he may have been watching the girls while they were inside the store. Based on Rona's description of this man, he was in his 30s and he might or might not have had a mustache. And he was also driving a dark colored vehicle, possibly burgundy or maroon. So for two whole days, the police and the public were on the lookout for a kidnapper that wasn't actually a kidnapper. I mean, I can't say that. Who knows who this guy was that Rona saw? He could have been a sketchy kidnapper, too. We don't know. But he wasn't the one who took Michaela. And Michaela's actual abductor could have been walking around in plain sight, protected by his absolute anonymity. Finally, police did speak to Trina, and they got a completely different description of this man. Michaela's kidnapper was a young man in his 20s with long, dirty blonde hair and severe acne, described as boils, which makes me think it must have been cystic acne. If anybody's had cystic acne, you know that they can get very boil-like. Trina said he was driving an older, tannish gold, full-sized sedan, boxy in shape, with body damage of some kind. And this man's eyes were specifically noted by Trina, who said, quote, He had fox eyes. He looked right at me, but he didn't even see me. End quote. Something else that was strange or unusual about this case is how quickly the FBI became involved. I believe they jumped on board within that first day. It may have had something to do with the fact that Michaela was not the only young child to go missing in the Bay Area in recent years. Five-year-old Angela Berga from Antioch was reported missing in mid-November of 1983, and her body was later found in a shallow grave miles from her apartment complex a week later. Ten-year-old Kevin Collins disappeared after basketball practice in San Francisco on February 10, 1984. He's never been located Two little girls, 8-year-old Amber Swartz Garcia and 4-year-old Candy Tellerico, were abducted just one day apart in June of 1988. Candy would be found 45 days later after being trapped that entire time in a cramped staircase cubbyhole under the altar of the Elk Grove United Methodist Church. She had been taken by the church handyman. Kenneth Elvin Michael, who was also holding another young girl captive at that church. But Amber, Amber Swartz Garcia, has still never been found. In March of 1987, six-year-old Jeremy Stoner had been abducted from Vallejo, and his body would later be recovered. In August of 1984, three-year-old Clark Handel was taken from his parents' home in West Fairfield. The year before that, in February of 1983, four-year-old Mitchell Owens had been taken from his parents' home in Menlo Park. In 1982, three-year-old Tara Burke was kidnapped and held captive in a van for 10 months before she was found by police who were led there by an 11-year-old boy who had also been held captive but managed to escape through the roof ventilator of the van. And that's just a handful of cases of children who were taken during the 80s in this specific area of California. Some of these children made it back home alive. Some did not. Some of their parents know what the fate of their child was. Some still do not. But these abductions were most likely on the radar of the FBI, and maybe they thought Michaela's kidnapping was connected. Once law enforcement had the correct information about the suspect, the investigation went full speed ahead. The police checked on and interviewed any and all local sex offenders nearby, and this is very standard procedure. In a case where a child is taken, um, because sadly, when young children are abducted, I feel, I don't know the exact number, but I feel like in my heart, it's like 95% of the time, it's for nefarious reasons and it's for sexual abuse. And there was also a composite sketch that was made of the suspect using Trina's description, and that sketch was checked against databases of known criminals. Volunteers took to the streets, knocking on doors and handing out flyers. 
When no sign of the little girl was found in the surrounding neighborhoods, police began searching the surrounding hills, ravines, parks, and abandoned areas where she might have been kept or where her body might be found. In late November, local police and FBI agents descended on these places, hoping to find something, even if it was just one clue, an article of clothing, something that that showed them that this girl hadn't just disappeared into thin air. Some of these officers were on horseback, some were accompanied by police dogs, and others were on foot. They flew helicopters over Garen Regional Park and Niles Canyon, which were heavily wooded areas that were located just within minutes of the Garrett home. And the reason for searching these areas was twofold. Three hikers had previously called the police claiming that they'd found footprints that looked as if they belonged to one adult and one child. And when the hikers followed the footprints, they found a blanket and some fast food containers. Additionally, a psychological profile of the perpetrator had claimed he would take Michaela to an isolated area outside of public view. They even used infrared cameras on the helicopters over some of the especially dense wooded areas, hoping to sense a heat signature to see if there was somebody hiding in the woods or somebody held captive in the woods. But all those searches came up with nothing. Michaela's case was featured on Unsolved Mysteries, America's Most Wanted, Her Face Was Put on Milk Cartons. It made national news, and no one could really understand how this young girl could be stolen in broad daylight, in the middle of, you know, a well-traveled area, the parking lot of a market. And there was no leads, no clues. Michaela and her abductor had vanished without a trace. Now, the Missing Children's Program sent out over 50 million mailing cards to homes all over the country, with Michaela's face on them, her information, the composite sketch of the suspect, hoping to bring in tips, and it did. It brought in a plethora of tips, but most of them were rumors or coming from attention seekers who like to insert themselves into crime cases. And we have talked about some of these people on this channel before in different videos, but it's it's just crazy how absolutely common that kind of thing is. And when all was said and done, investigators had followed over 15,000 leads and they'd come up with nothing. Now, there were suspects, however, who were actively pursued and questioned by law enforcement. And some of these suspects, they seemed like they could be definitely good for it. You know, like a lot of these suspects fit the profile. A lot of these suspects just seemed like they definitely had something to do with it. Most of these suspects weren't good people to begin with, right? So already you're thinking this is a criminal or this is somebody who's done a similar sort of crime. It must be him. And I remember before this new news came out about Michaela's case, I definitely had my list of suspects of who might have done this to her. And I might share that with you at the end of the video, like who was at my top and and going down and so forth. But during a series of interviews with the FBI in late 1991 and 1992, Roger Haggard, an inmate at an Indiana prison, confessed to knowing who had kidnapped and killed Michaela Garrett. And he knew this because it was his buddy and he'd helped his buddy bury her body. Now, those who interviewed him initially were not buying his elaborate story. It just didn't make sense. It didn't add up. Um, You know, he just seemed sketchy. And the FBI and police officers get this all the time. Prisoners who all of a sudden want to confess to crimes or say they know something about crime so they can get like a reduction in their sentence or just even, you know, better food in prison, et cetera. Just they want an edge. They want a benefit. So... They'll offer information, and a lot of the times, the information turns out to to be fake. So initially, the FBI declined his offer to help lead them to her body, which annoyed him. So Haggard wrote a letter to the San Francisco Chronicle, claiming once again to know the identity of Michaela's assailant, as well as the location of her body, and he was willing to lead law enforcement to her body. Unable to ignore him any longer with public outcry, the FBI flew him from Indiana to California to testify before a federal grand jury where he repeated his same claims. He knew who killed her, he was there when the body was buried, and he would lead them there. He promised he would show the FBI not only where the little girl could be found, but where the murderer lived. So the next day, Roger Haggard led FBI agents on a four-hour, 100-mile wild goose chase around the Bay Area, 
before finally fessing up and saying that he just lied. He made everything up, um, but he claimed he did so only to bring some peace to Michaela's family. Now, this idiot was already in prison, like I said, but he was only there for a burglary charge, which he'd been sentenced to 11 years in prison for. But because of this insensitive and time and resource wasting hoax, it was decided that Roger would be staying in prison for an additional six years. And he was also ordered to pay Michaela's family $7,000 for the false hope that he had given them, which understandably would cause a great deal of emotional trauma. Having a child missing, um, I've said it before, it's worse I can't I can't say that it's worse because I've never been in either situation, but I imagine that it would be worse than having your child die. Having your child missing, you don't know where they are. You don't know what's happening to them. You don't know if they're being hurt repeatedly, if they're being tortured. Um, so it's already a roller coaster to be, you know, in that position. And then to have somebody say, oh, I can give you closure, I can give you hope. And then to find out that he was just lying and he testified in front of a, a federal grand jury. So that's also a crime in itself to lie to a federal grand jury. But um, yeah, I think he definitely deserved another six years and, and you know, the $7,000. Now, there was another character in this story that has been a head scratcher for many of many an armchair detective for years. Now, I'm not going to use this man's real name in this video because, um, well, because he hasn't been charged with anything, A, and B, I think he's a little bit insane, so I don't want to be somebody on his radar. We're going to call him TB for the sake of this video. And if you do your own digging online, um, you can fairly easily find information on him. But TB was a 43-year-old married sewage treatment plant worker who first appeared on law enforcement radar in 1991. In 1991, law enforcement was investigating several cases of young girls who had gone missing in the area, and TB's name seemed to keep coming up due to his um, creepy behavior with young girls in his neighborhood, as well as his odd behavior with the parents of little girls who had gone missing. Now, the parents in TB's East Bay neighborhood reported to the police that he was trying to get close to their young daughters and, like, strike up friendships with these little girls by giving them gifts or money or sending them cards on their birthday. The only thing was, some of these cards would be written backwards so they could only be read if held up to a mirror, uh, which is creepy if you're a grown man sending a coded message to a little underage girl. Now, one card contained a love poem and Bible verses with certain words underlined, such as, I have chosen you, be with me where I am. Uh, TB claimed there was nothing nefarious about these little tokens of his affection. He was just being kind to these girls because he felt like they were lonely. Now, police did some digging into TB's background, and they found that this was sort of a pattern of behavior. In 1985, he'd been fired from his job as a social security claims officer because he'd been collecting the names, addresses, and birth dates of several young girls in Colorado. And he used this information to send multiple young girls $50 on their 14th birthdays. The exact number of how many girls he did this to is unknown, but it's reported that he did this with approximately 40 girls. So when he got caught doing this, he said he was just trying to add a touch of magic to the kids' lives, like a character he'd seen on a TV show. Um, he saw somebody on a TV show, like, giving things away for free, and it made people happy. So he said that he was just trying to do that. Uh, he was fired from his job, but he got his job back 16 months later after it was determined that he had not used the information he collected for personal gain. Because apparently that's all that matters. Sketchy morals and communicating with underage girls that you don't know is not a reason to lose your job. Using government resources to communicate with these young girls definitely not a reason to lose your job. He was fired unfairly. Poor TB. Now, allegedly, TB drove a light blue van with a license plate that read, Love You, L-O-V-Y-O-U. And inside the van, he had covered every inch with pictures of small children, uh, crayon drawings, 
Bible verses, poems, things like that. So basically the inside of TB's van was like the inside of, you know, every 90s 13-year-old girl's bedroom who like cut pictures of Leonardo DiCaprio out of Tiger Beat and like plastered them to the walls along with, you know, lyrics from love songs and things like that. Or was that just me? That was just me? Okay. TB was also once arrested for trying to lure two young girls into this creepy ass van. But those charges were dropped, and the only thing that he was ever charged with that stuck was public drunkenness. It's also reported that he once worked at a crematorium, and he liked to spend his free time hanging out in cemeteries repairing gravestones. Now, this man had also made contact with at least two of the parents of missing girls. It might have even been three. But it was definitely the mother of Amber Swartz Garcia, whose name was Kim, and the mother of Michaela Garrett, who was Sharon. Apparently, this dude just walked right up to their houses after their their children went missing, and he knocked on their doors. And when they answered, he volunteered to help, uh, help locate their daughters, help in any way he could. And these parents were not, like, huge fans of this kind of uh, interaction, so they did call the police and and reported him. TB was reported as having repeatedly interfered with the cases. He would call the parents repeatedly, like, over and over, asking if there's anything he could do to help. Um, He would show up at their houses. He would, like, go and research and try to solve the crime on his own. And he claims he was just trying to be helpful, a good Samaritan. But the families of these children, as well as law enforcement, feel that him forcing himself into the case was specifically so he could play mind games with the family. And he actually enjoyed leading them to believe that he may have been involved with what happened to their children. So basically, he was torturing them. Now, when one of the missing girls, little Angela Begay, was found dead and buried... TB repeatedly visited her grave and then went to her parents' house to inform them that he had done so. In a later interview with a forensic psychologist, TB admitted to having visited Angela's grave at least 80 times, most often at night, claiming he had fallen in love with Angela from the picture on her headstone. Just a few days after Amber Swartz Garcia was abducted, TB visited Angela's grave, and according to the FBI, who had him under surveillance at that time, he kissed the gravestone and then simulated a sex act. Amber's mother, Kim, remembered TB showing up at her doorstep three days after her daughter had vanished and telling her, quote, I wanted to be the one to save her. I wanted to be the one to bring her home to you, end quote. In 1988, it is reported that TB sent a letter to the police claiming that another girl would disappear and she would be nine years old. That same year, -year nine-year-old Michaela Garrett was abducted. Allegedly, he also sent an FBI profiler a Christmas card with the image of a little girl holding up four fingers. Not long after that, four-year-old Amanda Nikki Campbell disappeared on December 27, 1991. So uh, he's creepy to say the least. And he started kind of getting publicity for this. Um, Obviously, there was people who wanted to interview him and figure out, like, what the hell was going on with him. And he actually invited a reporter from the San Jose Mercury News, Linda Golston, to interview him. But he wanted to be interviewed at 4.30 in the morning at the Oakmont Cemetery where little Angela was buried. So apparently um, this reporter picked him up and they drove to the cemetery together. And while they were driving, um, the reporter asked him to play her his favorite song. And in a minute, I'll tell you what that favorite song was. So when Linda asked TB about his strange birthday cards, he said he thought they were nice. And he said that the kids liked them. So he hadn't done anything wrong. He also told Linda that he thought of the missing girls as his own children and told her his thoughts on their abductions, what had happened in great detail, like if they'd fought back or not, if one had been more meek and one had been stronger, if they'd screamed, stuff like that. And he also speculated um, what their assailant had been thinking. He said that the assailant had convinced himself he was saving the girls and delivering them to Jesus. And like I said, we'd come back to it in a minute. If all that wasn't weird enough, when he was asked in the car what his favorite song was, TB told Linda Golston it was Jesus, here's another child to hold. 
So eventually the publicity did reach like a, a high peak and, um, you know, his name was being printed in papers and TB and his family were being harassed and threatened by the general public who honestly felt like he had something to do with at least one of these missing girls. So TB filed a defamation lawsuit against the city of Fairfield and he won. So like I said, this is kind of a slippery slope and this is why I didn't want to use his real name. Although he has been suspected for years of being involved with some of these missing children, he's always claimed to have had nothing to do with any of them going missing. And the evidence against him is circumstantial at best. The one piece of evidence that I believe is the most solid is the fact that after having him under surveillance and watching him visiting Angela's grave multiple times, police dogs were brought to the spot and they picked up the scent of Nikki Campbell, who was at that time missing. So Angela went missing first. Angela died, was buried. TB starts going to her grave a bunch. And then Nikki goes missing. And this is after he allegedly sent a Christmas card to an FBI profiler with a little girl holding up four fingers and Nikki was four. So I guess it stands to reason that if he really enjoyed going to Angela's grave for whatever reason, if he had taken Nikki, he may have brought her there to share that with her. I can't get inside the minds of these people, but that's obviously kind of what what I'm thinking may have happened. Now, investigators in the Campbell case did question TB in relation to her disappearance, and he was named officially as a suspect in 1992, but the specific evidence with the the dogs, the cadaver dogs, it wasn't enough to get an arrest, and it definitely wasn't enough to use in court. Now, TB could very well just be um, a misguided person maybe mentally ill in some ways. Maybe he thinks what he's doing is helpful. He was given an award for heroism by the California Highway Patrol for his rescue efforts during the 1989 earthquake in California. But the mother of Angela Swartz certainly found him to not be very helpful. After he had first approached her offering to help with her missing daughter, the police had urged Kim Swartz to not get close to TB, but sort of like give him hope that that there was some sort of like possibility there, like the door was open. And every time she talked to him or met with him, she left her interactions with him feeling that it was all a game to TB, saying, quote, he was walking that fine line, knowing exactly where he can go with it. I think he was getting off on taunting me and my family, end quote. TB had also told Kim Swartz to read the book, Crime in Punishment. And in this book, This one character who keeps turning up, who keeps finding himself in the middle of everything, turns out to be the one who actually committed the crime. So it's a little kind of like a a wink and a nod, I guess. As far as TB is concerned, I definitely think he could have had something to do with one or more of these disappearances, especially considering um, how often he visited Angela's grave, that he said he fell in love with her by the picture on her tombstone. That's not normal. This is not something that a mentally healthy person does. Um, So there's something wrong there, in my opinion. If all that is true, there's something wrong there, and he could very well be responsible for what happened to her or, you know, any of the other girls. But as far as Michaela, even though he did present himself to Michaela's mother after Michaela went missing and asked to help and kind of made himself a general nuisance, um, I, I don't think he was involved with that case. And even before I knew the new information that came out recently this month, I, I still didn't think that he was. It, it just didn't add up. But like I said, I think he's definitely not right. Definitely not right at all. Another suspect for a time was 35-year-old Kyle Allen Raymer. Okay, so imagine you see a homeless man sleeping in the park in a rainstorm, and you feel bad. So you invite him to come home with you so that he has a roof to sleep under and a dry bed for the night. And as he's sleeping, you're watching TV, and you see his face on America's Most Wanted. Sounds like the plot of a horror movie, but this is exactly what happened to Robert and Karen DeCosta of Lakeport, California. Karen DeCosta saw Kyle Raymer sleeping in the park. It was raining. She felt bad, and she invited him to come back with her to her home, allowing him to sleep in her five-year-old daughter's bed while the girl slept in her parents' bed. And the DeCosta's two sons, three and four years old, slept in the room right next to this strange man that Karen had never met before. 
before opening her home to him. So Raymer fell asleep. The couple and their two friends sat down in the living room to watch television that evening, and then a photograph of their new guest flashed on the television screen with the information that he was wanted for multiple counts of child molestation. Obviously, the police were called and Kyle was arrested, and after a background check, it was discovered that Kyle had been very busy before finding himself in a warm and cozy bed within reach of three innocent children. He was a registered sex offender in Lake County and had been arrested in 1994 for molesting a seven-year-old girl in San Jose. He'd also been charged with attempting to kidnap a 10-year-old girl from Golden Gate Park in San Francisco. And he had molested a six-year-old girl at a nudist camp. Can you answer this? Because I just can't seem to find in my head or in the depths of the universe any reason why a six-year-old girl would be at a nudist camp. And I also can't understand why these people would have invited this dude into their house to sleep in the same general vicinity as their children, knowing nothing about him. Nothing about him. Okay? I get it. You feel bad. You want to give a homeless man uh, a roof to sleep under, at least call the police and have them do a background check or something. Like, I personally would say don't invite any any strangers into your house to spend the night, but um, that's just me. But if you are this kind of person that that wants to to do good by, I guess, personally opening your home to strangers— Uh, Do your due diligence first. So now the police have Kyle in custody, and he seems to really fit for the Michaela Garrett abduction. Like, he could have actually been responsible for what happened to her. His age fit, his physical description fit, he was a repeat sexual offender, and his victim of choice seemed to be girls around Michaela's age, and he'd been active in the Bay Area. But Kyle Allen Raymer, although definitely not an innocent man, not a good man by any means, was also not the right suspect for this specific case, considering his alibi was pretty airtight. He'd been in jail at the time of the abduction, so there was another promising lead and another dead end. Then we have another man. If you can call him that, I wouldn't, but technically he's a man. And his name was Curtis Dean Anderson. So on December 9th, 1999, seven-year-old Zayana Fairchild never made it home from school. Her mother called the school and found out the horrifying information. I can only imagine how horrifying this information was that her daughter had never even shown up to school that morning. On August 12th, 2000, eight-year-old Mitzi Sanchez was walking home from school, excited to get home to celebrate her eighth birthday with her family. It was legitimately her eighth birthday that day. And she was just two blocks away from her Vallejo, California home when she noticed a man sitting in his car, watching her through his rearview mirror. He got out of his car and she... She felt like she should cross the street and and maybe it wasn't safe. But when he got out and he asked Mitzi if she could help him grab a roll of duct tape from the floorboard of his car so he could fix a window, she agreed to because children are conditioned and taught to obey um, their elders, especially during this time. Um, I, I, I would say as a parent, and I hate to get off track, but as a parent, I would be very clear with your children Um, it's not like obey all your elders, it's obey your parents and like your grandparents and run away from all strangers. So when Mitzi reached down to get the tape, this man put his hand over her mouth and forced her into the car, driving her past her own home where her mother was preparing her birthday festivities. Um, she, she was literally driven past her own home on her birthday after being abducted And she said she saw her house and all she wanted was to be inside of it. So this man, he drove her to the parking lot of a shopping center and he forced her to change into clothes that he'd already bought and brought with him. He then forced her to drink alcohol before sexually abusing her. And then he put a padlock around her leg and chained her to the inside of his car, making sure that the car windows were covered up by blankets so no one could see her inside. Mitzi remembered thinking that she was never going to see her family again. For two days, this man, Curtis Dean Anderson, drove this scared little girl around the Bay Area, abusing her and only leaving, um, sometimes at night, where he would go inside and watch TV. And then he'd come back out and tell Mitzi that he was watching her mother on TV, crying for her daughter's return and pleasuring himself to it. 
So this is how this girl, this young girl, spent her eighth birthday. Fortunately, one night, Anderson forgot the keys to the padlock in the car, and Mitzi took her chance. She grabbed the key ring. There was a bunch of keys on it. She said she just grabbed the smallest one on this key ring, put it in the padlock, and it, and it fit. And she freed herself, and she jumped out the car window and started running. She could hear him yelling for her to come back. But she didn't stop. She didn't go back. She ran until she found help, and Anderson was in police custody within hours. Now, after being put in prison for Mitzi's kidnapping and assault, Anderson bragged to his prison friends how he had abducted and killed at least 15 other little girls, including Ziana Fairchild, whose partial remains were found in the hills above Los Gatos in January of 2001. He told investigators that he held her captive for several weeks and took video of himself molesting her. When asked how he'd killed her, Anderson claimed that as an avid drug user himself, he knew the amount of narcotics that he would need to give Ziana to cause a fatal overdose in a small child, saying, quote, I know what drugs do, okay? It's all body weight, end quote. He claimed that this little girl's last words were, I'm tired, as the drugs took effect. Now, that was not all that Anderson confessed to. Remember the kidnapping of Amber Swartz Garcia that we talked about in the beginning of this video? Anderson claimed that he'd seen her standing on a street corner. He forced her into his car and eventually killed her in Arizona. Now, Amber, who was only seven years old, was last seen skipping rope in front of her home in Contra Costa County while she waited for her neighbor to get home. See, her neighbor had just had a baby, and Amber couldn't wait to meet this new baby, so she wanted to stay outside and wait for her neighbor to get home. And her mother, Kim, said she took her eyes off Amber for three minutes tops, and then she was gone. Now, unfortunately, before Anderson could give more information, he died suddenly in his jail cell. I believe it was kidney and liver failure, probably all those narcotics. Hopefully uh, those caught up to him. I hope it was painful. I hope he suffered very, very, very much. Now, although both the Pinole Police Department, where Amber went missing, as well as the FBI felt that Anderson's signed confession, along with the circumstantial evidence, was enough to close the case on Amber's disappearance, her mother, Kim, wasn't able to completely accept that this guy was responsible, saying that she would rather have Amber listed as a missing person forever than to have the case closed with the wrong perpetrator. Now, although no information has been received that would dispute the confession of Anderson, Amber has never been located. So the police department did decide to reopen the case, hoping that more tips would come in. For a while there, many believed that Curtis Dean Anderson may have been the man who took Michaela Garrett. He was within the age range of her kidnapper at the time when it happened. It certainly fit his M.O., and he had bragged about killing multiple little girls that we would never find. You know, I, when I say we, I don't mean like me and you. I mean people in general, her parents, the police, the public. He said, I killed all these girls, and you'll never find most of them. But he'd only ever actually confessed to three, I believe. Additionally, in 1989, he was pulled over driving a brown 1977 Chevy sedan, very similar in looks to the car that Trina had seen Michaela's kidnapper driving. Now, due to his untimely death, they were never able to ask him um, or verify about Michaela or even verify about Amber. But something interesting though, Curtis had a son also named Curtis, Curtis Dean Anderson Jr., to be specific. Curtis Jr. was also a, uh, a criminal, and he was serving a 16-year prison sentence for voluntary manslaughter in 2019 when he took his own life in his jail cell at the age of 32. So make of that what you will. What I want to say, I'm going to keep in my head because it's savage. Another suspect in Michaela's kidnapping was a man who had become notorious for another kidnapping, that of J.C. Dugard. In 2009, 20 years after Michaela's disappearance, something happened that gave her mother Sharon hope that what she'd prayed for all those years could be true. Michaela could still be alive. Now, Sharon, Michaela's mother, for years, anytime anybody would ask her she was interviewed, she would say, I believe my daughter is still alive. And I think that she really used that hope as a buoy to keep her afloat, to keep her going, to keep her um, giving the interviews and writing the letters and, you know, raising awareness about Michaela's case so that it could be solved. I think that that hope was what she needed. 
And I mean, this woman was tireless in trying to find out what happened to her daughter. I have nothing but respect and love for her. Well, on June 10th, 1991, 11-year-old J.C. Dugard was walking to her bus stop in Myers, California. She was wearing her favorite pink outfit. A car approached her, and she thought at first maybe the man driving would be asking her for directions because the car was kind of going slow. But instead, when he rolled down the window, the man, Philip Garado, had a stun gun in his hand. And he used it to stun J.C. and then get her in the car with the help of his wife, Nancy Garrido. Confused and scared, J.C. was in and out of consciousness for three hours in the car while Nancy held her down as they drove from Myers, California to Antioch, 120 miles away. And for 18 years, J.C.'s mother had no idea where her daughter was or what had happened to her. For 18 years, Philip and Nancy Garrido held her captive on their property, at first in a soundproof shed where J.C. was used and abused by Philip whenever he wanted, and then left alone all by herself. Um, <laughs> it's so sad. For the entire first week, he left her alone all by herself, handcuffed besides the parts where he came in and sexually abused her. J.C. was with these monsters for three years before they even gave her cooked food. And at that point, the Garritos told J.C. that they thought she might be pregnant. She was 14 years old when her first daughter was born in captivity and 17 when her second daughter was born. Both girls were fathered by Philip Garrido. Now, on August 24, 2009, Philip Garrido visited the UC Berkeley campus accompanied by J.C. and her two daughters. Her oldest daughter at this point was 14 and her youngest was 11, the same age that J.C. had been when she was stolen from her life and locked away for the pleasure of a twisted and evil couple. So Philip and the girls were on campus because Philip wanted to see if he could hold a religious event on the campus called the God's Desire Program. He spoke with the woman who was in charge of special events at the college, who at that time was Nancy Campbell, and she found his behavior to be both odd and erratic. Nancy also noticed how quiet and almost submissive his three companions were. She asked Philip to leave his information and return the next day for a meeting to kind of iron out the details. But after he left, she had campus security run a background check on him. And it was discovered that Philip Garrido was a registered sex offender on parole for kidnapping and rape. Now, Officer Allie Jacobs of Campus Security observed Philip Garrido and the three girls the next day at this meeting, and she felt something was very wrong. The girls all seemed to be really pale, as if they didn't get outside a lot, as if they weren't in the sun, and they were very meek and they were acting unusual. So she called the parole board, which prompted two parole officers to drive over to the Greedos and check things out. Now, obviously they found JC, um, she was returned. To me, this is not uh, the happiest of endings, right? Because uh, I, I don't see how she could ever really get over that, what happened. And, you know, there's just a lot of a lot of stuff in this case. But one of the worst parts about this case is how many times J.C. could have been saved over the years. How many times law enforcement of some kind was physically in the Garrido household while she and her daughters were being kept there? I, I can't get into it that deeply in this video. Like I said, I wish I could. But if you want a full video or a series, which it would be, it would be a series on J.C. Dugard, let me know in the comments because it really is tragic and heartbreaking. But it is also a story of survival and strength. And I think that there's a lot of... Uh, a lot of things to discuss there. So when J.C. Dugard was found alive after all those years, Michaela's mother, Sharon, felt reinforced in her belief that her own daughter was still out there somewhere. Both J.C. and Michaela's abductions had similarities. They were both roughly the same age when they'd been taken. They looked similar. I mean, I see it reported that people believed they looked like they could be sisters. They were so similar. And both had been brazenly abducted in broad daylight very quickly. The vehicle in Michaela's case was similar to the sedan found on the Greedo property, and Philip Greedo, in his younger years, resembled the composite sketch of Michaela's abductor. It was also discovered that in the late 80s, Garrido was living at a halfway house about 20 miles from where Michaela was taken. Now, Trina Rodriguez, Michaela's friend who had witnessed her abduction, saw pictures of Philip when he was younger on television, and she said she recognized something in his eyes, saying, quote, I see that same intensity, that same creepy look that I don't think I'll ever forget, end quote. Now, Sharon Murch's first thought when J.C. was found was, let Michaela be with her. And she said, quote, 
I know if J.C. Dugard can be found alive and come home after 18 years, then my daughter can still be found and come home, end quote. I am hoping that this will lead to a resolution, and I'm hoping that it will lead to a positive resolution. I know that if J.C. Dugard can be found alive and come home after 18 years, then my daughter can be found alive and come home after 18 years. If this should not turn out to be the answer that we seek, the answer is still out there. If Michaela might still be out there alive like J.C. was out there alive, perhaps she will see herself in your stories. Perhaps that will give her the courage that she needs to break free from whatever situation she's been in and come home to us. And I just want to say, Michaela, if you're out there somewhere within the sound of my voice, I just want you to know that we love you. We miss you. There's nothing that could possibly have happened over the last 20 years that could change that. And we want you to come home. Now, the police did question the Greedos about their possible involvement in Michaela's kidnapping, but the couple insisted they had nothing to do with it. Police also, I believe, asked JC if any other girls had been held with her while she was at the Greedos, and she said that there hadn't been, not that she'd seen. She'd been absolutely alone until the birth of her daughters, and then all they'd had was each other. Eventually, Philip and Nancy Greedo were cleared of any involvement in Michaela's kidnapping, if you want to call it that. Like, I hate saying they were cleared because they're monsters and scumbags, but the police didn't think they had anything to do with what happened to Michaela, at least. And the next lead in this case wouldn't come until 2012, when Wesley Shermantine, one half of the twisted duo of murderers called the Speed Freak Killers, sent a letter to the Stockton Record claiming his partner and fellow speed freak, Lauren Herzog, was the one who had taken and killed Michaela. Together, the two men were suspected of taking at least 20 lives in the 80s and 90s on this, like, methamphetamine kind of drug binge, I guess. That's why they were called the speed freak killers. They were just really into meth, and they were apprehended in 1999. However... The justice system had been a little easier on Lauren Herzog than it had been on Wesley Shermantine. Herzog had, I guess, confessed to three murders, and he was initially sentenced to 78 years in prison, which is, to me, not a lot for three murders. But uh, it came out that his confessions had been illegally obtained by the police, so the sentence had been reduced to 14 years, which definitely, definitely isn't isn't a lot for three murders. And he was actually paroled in 2010 after serving only 11 of those years, because say it with me, guys, our justice system is incredibly flawed. Now, his partner in crime, Shermantine, was sentenced to death for his part in the four murders that, that he'd been involved with. And from death row, he wrote this letter asking for a monetary payment. I think it was like thirty dollars or $40,000. And he wanted to give this to his son on the outside. And the police were like, no, we're not going to pay you money for information on where you buried bodies of people you killed. That's insane. But they did offer to commute his death sentence to life in prison, which allegedly he he didn't take. He refused that. He was like, no, I'll stay on death row and I'll still help you anyway. So I don't know if there was a little like guilt there or if he was just hoping that he would get a payment or maybe he did get the payment like under the table and they just don't want to report it. Because I don't see a man who, you know, claimed to have killed like 20 something people feeling, you know, really like bad and having some crisis of conscience at any point. But maybe anything's possible, right? Anything's possible. So on the day that it was announced that Wesley Shermantine was helping the police locate victims of the speed free killers, his old friend, Lauren Herzog, um, who was out on parole, remember, just living his life, he took his own life. So good riddance, probably best for everybody. And it's obviously suspected that he did this because um, his buddy was about to, you know, bring out a whole new plethora of, of people that the Speed Free Killers had taken out. And this would allow law enforcement to bring new charges against Herzog, which would take him out of normal life and put him back in prison. So that's believed to be the reason why why he took his own life. Once again, I don't think he was having a an attack of guilt or a crisis of conscience, I think he was just like, I'm not going back there. This is the comedy police. The joke's too funny. I'm not going back to jail. 
So Wesley Shermantine did lead investigators to an old well in his and Herzog's hometown, Linden, California. And in this well, several bones were found, I think something like a thousand, as well as many personal possessions that Shermantine claimed had belonged to their victims. Now there were a pair of little girls' shoes found. They were black, like the shoes Michaela had been wearing when she'd gone missing. I mean, she didn't go missing. She was abducted. I hate when, I hate when people say, like, she went missing or when she died. It's like she was abducted and and then murdered. It's not missing and died. I do it sometimes myself too because I just don't want to use the same words over and over again, but let's call it what it is. Additionally, one of the bones found in the well appeared to belong to a child about her age at the time that she was abducted. But after it was tested, the DNA of the bone did not match Michaela Garrett. And that brings us to this year, 2020, when District Attorney Nancy O'Malley announced just this month, December, that an arrest had been made in the case, finally, so many years later. The man charged with Michaela's kidnapping is 59-year-old David Mish, who's been in prison since 1989 after being convicted of a double murder. Now, apparently, a palm print was found on the scooter that had lured Michaela over to her abductor's car, and that print had been matched to David Mish. And additionally, it's now being reported that other eyewitnesses have placed him in the parking lot of the Rainbow Market on the day Michaela was taken. So I assume people in the parking lot, people like that, that the police interviewed at that time, but didn't tell us about. Now, I was having a hard time finding anything out about this man besides vague suggestions of like a past criminal history and, you know, just the same information regurgitated over and over again in articles which is very common. And I was lucky enough, though, to stumble upon an article by Nick Wojcik. I hope I said her name right. And the title of this article is David Mish, The System Failed to Protect Michaela Garrett from a Serial Killer in the Making. And this article actually gave me a lot more insight into not only David Mish's past criminal activity, but also kind of the timeline. And it's frustrating because as this article suggests, this man could have and should have been stopped multiple times before he ever crossed paths with Michaela Garrett. Okay, so this article says that when David Mish, I don't know if it's David Mish or Mish, but he's a criminal and he's a bad person, so don't come for me if I pronounce his name incorrectly because he doesn't deserve me to pronounce his name correctly. But this article says that when David Mish was 16 years old, He was convicted of breaking into a neighbor's home and raping a woman at Knife Point who worked as a maid in the house. That was just when he was 16. So if we do some quick math, uh, David Mish is 59 in 2020, which puts his birth year in 1961. And I'm pretending that I'm doing this math in my head, but I'm not. I already did it on my calculator. But that means he would have been 16 in 1977. So that means this happened him going into a neighbor's house and raping the maid. This happened in 1977. So he rapes a woman while holding her at knife point. He goes to jail and he's paroled in 1978, a year in prison for for that, for doing that, a year in prison, right? But, but Mish wasn't done. And why would he be? <laughs> why would he be when there was basically no consequences for the horrible things he liked to do? In February of 1979, he was arrested for false imprisonment and assault with a deadly weapon. Later, the charge was updated to include assault to commit rape. Once again, he went to prison, and once again, he was paroled in September of 1981. In July of 1982, he was convicted of assault after holding a woman at knife point and beating her. Once again, he went to prison. Once again, he was released in January of 1984. Not even a full two years later. So the year he was released, 1984, in September, he was charged with indecent exposure. And a year later, in August of 1985, he was charged with indecent exposure again after driving naked through Oakland. In February of 1986, he killed his first known victims, 18-year-old Michelle Xavier and her friend, 20-year-old Jennifer Dewey. On February 2nd, the two women who had been friends for years went to a birthday dinner at a restaurant in Fremont, California, and on their way home, they stopped at a convenience store, 7-Eleven, I believe, and uh, I think they were seen on surveillance there. This was the last time they were seen alive. Shortly after midnight, their bodies were found naked and thrown on the side of the road. 
They had both been stabbed, and one of them had also been shot. For 32 years, what happened to these young women has remained a mystery, but in 2018, thanks to DNA technology, David Misch was identified as their killer. At around the same time that he was murdering innocent women, David Misch was also being considered for a court drug diversion program due to more than one drug-related and burglary incident. Now, it's not clear whether they were separate, like... Um, this is a drug incident, this is a burglary incident, or whether they were drug slash burglary incidents, I don't think it matters, but um, the court thought it was bad enough where he he probably needed some, some help. In May of 1988, Mish was arrested for burglary at a San Leandro market, and he was sentenced to one year in prison and one year probation. But he didn't stay behind bars for one full year. He was barely in there six months before he was released in November, the same month Michaela Garrett would be snatched from the Rainbow Market parking lot. Within days of abducting Michaela, Mish was once again in police custody, arrested on possession charges, but he would be released on parole on November 17, 1989. And the month after that, in December of 1989, he killed another woman, Margaret Ball, a woman he had been friends with for years, who was found stabbed to death by her stepdaughter in her home near Hayward, which was also where Michaela lived. Before she'd been killed, Margaret had been beaten violently, and her front tooth was found six inches away from her body in a pool of blood. By the time DNA from underneath the fingernails of one of his 1986 victims pointed law enforcement in his direction, he'd already been charged and sentenced in this murder, the murder of Margaret Ball, and he was already behind bars by 1989. So this is the guy who they're saying kidnapped Michaela, and it's now assumed that Michaela, like his other victims, is no longer alive even though they haven't found her body, and authorities say they will never stop looking. Now, the probable cause document says that Mish refused to speak to detectives on December 2nd, and he also refused to give them a DNA sample. But the physical evidence that they do have shows that David Mish kidnapped Michaela and then killed her to avoid the risk of discovery. Detective Robert Purcell of the Hayward Police Department said in that document, quote, I believe that it is reasonable to conclude that having violently abducted the victim, a nine-year-old girl who hasn't been seen in 32 years and whose remains have never been found, that Mish murdered the victim, disposed of her remains, and has successfully kept her remains hidden from authorities, end quote. But according to David Misch's attorney, Ernie Castillo, who has also been representing Misch on some of his other murder charges, the science used to tie his client to Michaela's case is, quote, junk science. Misch's lawyer Ernie said, quote, David Misch is a loving father, brother, and son and had nothing to do with the disappearance of Michaela Garrett. He wouldn't hurt or kill a child as they're accusing him of, end quote. Now, the question I initially had when I heard about this new information and this new, you know, arrest and the new charges, the question I had was, why now? If Mish has been behind bars since 1989 and they've had the palm print from the scooter since 1988, which is what matched him to the scene, why did it take so long to put two and two together? Well, in 2018, when Mish became a suspect and was charged in the deaths of Michelle Xavier and Jennifer Dewey, Fremont police actually reached out to the Hayward police, feeling that there may be a connection between their double murder and the abduction case of Michaela Garrett. According to KTVU News, authorities would not specifically say what led them to believe that the two cases might be connected because, in my opinion, there's there's not a lot of similarities. Uh, the ages are different. His double murder victim's bodies were found, like, that night. Michaela never has been found. So, I mean, to me, there's not a ton of similarities right off the bat just from the naked eye not having access to the police files. But this alleged connection prompted them to pull out that old palm print and compare it to David Misch, and they found a match. Now, apparently, uh, this had to be done with, like, the naked eye, with just looking at it and comparing two palm prints because it was too small or too intricate to be put through, um, you know, like a computer system. So they say it had to be done manually. And when they say manually, that means that they're actually just looking at it with their human eye. And Misha's attorney, Ernie Castillo, has a big problem with this, saying, quote, we will definitely be attacking any concept or idea that a person can, with their human eye, be able to distinguish ridges or whatever type of patterns we have in our hands. They don't have a body. We don't know if 
this kid is dead or not, or if she's alive. To start dumping everything on this guy, it's an easy way to close a case. It's an easy way to pat themselves on the back, end quote. And while I don't necessarily disagree with Ernie that I think uh, comparing palm prints or fingerprints manually with the human eye is a little tricky, and while I don't agree and we can't deny this has happened before, the wrong person ends up being convicted of a crime just so the case can be closed. And yeah, Mish would be kind of like an easy fall guy considering he's already in prison. So you're not like locking up an innocent man. I really wish that that Ernie Castillo would have a little bit of respect for Michaela Garrett and not call her this kid or that kid. Like we don't even know if this kid is dead. She has a name, Ernie say it, say her name, because uh, she's not this kid or that kid. She was an innocent child who your client may have kidnapped and murdered. And you can you can show a little bit more respect when you're talking about her. Okay, Ernie. But I mean, I guess we'll have to see. Um, We'll have to wait and see if there's a trial, what kind of experts they bring in, you know, people who will be able to speak to the similarities between David Misha's palm print and the palm print found on the scooter. If the if these experts, if these forensic people are convincing enough, you know, it might go through. I definitely don't think a jury's going to have any problem convicting him of this since he clearly has a history of being like a bad person. I would be interested in seeing it go to trial, though, just because I'm a little hesitant to believe right off the bat that uh, that, that he's the guy. And it's just because the M.O. is different. Um, he, yes, he's been known allegedly to kill three women, but these were grown women. Um, so as far as we know, he's never kidnapped or murdered a child before. And usually killers like this will have a specific M.O., a specific type that they go after. And it's not as if there was like a big chunk of time between um, what happened to um, the two friends that he killed and his friend that he killed and Michaela's abduction. They were all kind of like within, you know, a few years of each other. So it's not as if um, a lot of time had passed where he could change his MO or change his tastes, I guess. Uh, the MO doesn't, doesn't really fit for me, but I would be interested to see you know, what else they have on him. And if it's only circumstantial and if they can't uh, make a case in court, I would like to see her case remain open because we did talk about multiple suspects in this video that I think match up a lot better to to who might have done this to Michaela. People whose MOs do match, people whose um, physical appearances match. And apparently, I haven't seen this picture yet, but one of the news articles said that they have a picture of David Meesh when he was in his 20s and he resembles very much the picture of Michaela's assailant. So I have to see that, but I'm going to have to get a lot more information before I just jump on the bandwagon and say like, yeah, he's the guy. Um, A round of applause for law enforcement. You guys did it. It's so long since it happened. And I really don't want to see the case closed just for the sake of closing it. I want to see whoever did it be brought to justice or, you know, be be found out whether this person's alive or dead or in prison or what. I, I want to know who who actually did it. So we'll have to see what uh, what the police have. But before we close out this video, I do want to read you something that Michaela's mother, Sharon, wrote on her blog. Now, Sharon has been blogging about her daughter's disappearance for a very long time. It's called Seekers Road. Um, that's the blog. I'll link it in the description box if you want to check it out. And she wrote this on December 19th, 2020. And I have to warn you, as I was reading this, it did make me cry. It made me sob like a little baby. So um, it, it's going to be emotional. I think as a mother especially. It's it's emotional because you never want to see yourself in, in these people's shoes. You feel empathy. You feel sympathy. You feel so bad that, that, that these people, mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters, grandparents, lose these, these little children in their lives. But you almost um, stop yourself from, from putting yourself in their shoes too much because it, it's, very, it's very tough. And reading this, it really threw me into Sharon's shoes. Almost unwillingly at a point, I didn't want to, um, to, to go that, that deep into it. I kind of wanted to stay a little bit separate from this case because it is uh, close to my heart. Any cases that deal with children, um, if you've been with me for a while, you know that, that I, do, I do get a little attached. So I try to always kind of keep like an, un- an unbiased distance, but, you know, it's hard, especially when you read this. So this is what Sharon wrote um, on December 19th, 2020. They have not found Michaela, but they have identified her kidnapper. He is in prison and is currently on trial for two other murders. 
He is a monster. Seriously, what drives a human being to do something like this? On Monday, just before the press conference, they will be filing homicide charges against this man. David Meesh is his name. You aren't going to find a lot of information about him or about the investigation. That will come from the Hayward Police Department. As for me, what you will hear about from me is the only thing I care about, Michaela. And maybe love, maybe grief, maybe faith. Although I have to tell you, I feel as though I am wandering around, lost. I am looking, looking again for the answers I thought I had found, but all I can find now is emptiness. There has been this really big feeling that has been rolling around inside me, creating a giant hole, and just this morning, I figured out what it is. It is a feeling that my daughter has been alone for these 32 years. While I was running around doing interviews, writing blogs, tying ribbons on trees, she was lying, cold, and alone. You know that I have been able to accept the likelihood that Michaela was no longer alive. How many times have I said it would be a comfort to know that she had been in a better place for all these years rather than spending a lifetime in pain, fear, grief? But what I realize is that I had never at all been able to envision her being dead. Mish killed his victims by stabbing. One young woman was shot, but on that occasion he was trying to kill two at once. So this is what I'm left with. I can only touch the edges of this knowledge just skimming the surface, because it is too painful. While I have envisioned Michaela as not living in this world, she was always in a good place. I have seen her floating on clouds, running in grass meadows. I have literally envisioned the two of us sitting on stars in eternity, drinking tea and chatting in a place where all the horrors of this life have faded into insignificance in the greater whole. Now, for some reason, I can no longer see those places. I can only see my child, cold and alone. I feel like I abandoned her to pursue a rabbit trail, when all this time I should have been lying with her. To Michaela, I am so, so sorry, baby girl. I feel as though I let you down in a million ways. I was listening to Rescue by Lauren Daigle yesterday. This has been my song for you, and I broke down because I had not been able to rescue you. I wonder if God can rescue me. I am trying to hold on to what has kept me going for a while now, and that is that I know you are a bright and shining light. You were a light to all who knew you when you were here in the world, and you have been a light even to strangers beyond number since you have been gone. I will, we will, try to keep that light shining for you. I love you forever, baby girl. Rest well. I have some things to do here yet, but I will see you in the not terribly distant future. As always, make sure you let me know what you all think about this case and this news in the comment section. I really enjoy talking to you. Let me know if you want me to cover in depth any of these other cases um, that we talked about, any of these other victims or killers that we talked about. Make sure to follow me on Twitter and Instagram. The links are in the description box. Make sure to subscribe if you haven't already. And if you are subscribed, make sure that you still are because YouTube does unsubscribe people from my channel. I think they're afraid that, uh, that I will taint you all with this true crime life. But uh, make sure you're still subscribed because they do unsubscribe people from my channel. And also make sure you like this video if you liked it. Make sure you share it if you think it's worth sharing. There could be a chance that this David guy, this David Mish guy, isn't the one. He may not be the one. And I would really like to see this case solved concretely. And I think that the Sharon and uh, Rod, Michaela's parents, would also probably really like to see this finally come to a close. Also, don't forget to follow the link in the description box to Crime Weekly so you can subscribe to the podcast wherever you listen to your podcasts. It's Spotify, Pandora, iHeartRadio, iTunes, whatever floats your boat. My co-host Derek Lavasser and I talk about uh, different crime every week. Sometimes we do two-parters. We just finished the Jennifer Dulos two-parter. I think we're in the midst of the Joel Guy two-parter. And uh, it's just really fun having his perspective. And I think it's a nice mix. So make sure you subscribe to that so you never miss a podcast. And uh, this is the last video of 2020. So the next time I see you, it will be 2021. And I have a lot a lot in store for you guys, a lot of very interesting cases, a lot of um, really in-depth multi-parters, a lot of interesting coffee and crime times that I've been storing up. So we will see each other very, very soon. Have an amazing new year. Take care of yourself. Take care of your loved ones. 
hug your kids a little tighter after this video because I know that is what I will be doing. And uh, I will see you soon. Stay kind. Stay beautiful. Bye. I got blood, blood on the strings